This is Star Talk. Welcome to Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And we're recording this out of the world headquarters of Mashable, right here in New York City. And today we're gonna to tell you everything you ever wanted to know and perhaps what you didn't even wanna know about the upcoming great American eclipse. America. American eclipse. Co-host is Chuck Nice. Hey, buddy. Chuck, love you, man. Love you too, man. And he also hosts the spinoff of Star Talk, Playing with science. That's correct. Playing with science. That's right. It's when you, a, when it's. You, when you play with science, I, I should. Did you get permission to play with science? <laughs> <laughs> Has your mother caught you playing with science, Chuck? <laughs> huh? Hey, there's a lock on that door for a reason. Don't you know I can make you go blind? <laughs> 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 so just to remind you, because I'm, I'm, I'm not in that show. So no, playing with science is uh, Gary O'Reilly, who is a former footballer, and uh, Chuck Nice, who is some guy. And um, we actually have uh, different... Um, athletes on the show, and we take what uh, what somebody says. Where s jocks and geeks collide without a concussion, <laughs> without, <laughs> without a concussion. It's amazing. And so what we do is we take sports and science, and we break down the science in the sports, and we discuss the sports as well. It's a lot of fun. That's a recent spinoff. That's recent why spin I, I'm still learning about what you guys cooked up over there. So, but thanks for joining us. Absolutely. And you know what we have today. By video call, we have an expert guest. Is my friend and colleague and an associate at the Hayden Planetarium, Joe Rayo. Joe, thanks for thanks for How being you doing? on. Just to get some of your background here, you're a broadcast meteorologist, and you wrote the children's book "Looking Up: The Science of Stargazing." And so, absolutely, and, yeah, yeah. It's it's good good to have you. Always good to get your input on nighttime cosmic phenomena. In this case. It would be daytime phenomena. Yeah. And in particular, this episode of Star Talk is officially designated a Cosmic Queries just on the eclipse. Just on the so, eclipse. Yeah. So we'll go to Cosmic Queries intermittently, but I want to get sort of Joe in the mix here. Joe, uh, I, I've seen one eclipse in my life. You've seen some uncountable number of eclipses. How many total minutes of totality have you been steeped in? Wow. I have seen 11 this will be, I'll make it an even dozen with the upcoming Great American Eclipse. And, um, you know, that, that number may sound very impressive to a lot of your uh, viewers, uh, Neil, but, uh, and it was impressive 40 years ago, but there are people out there who have seen far many, far many more than I have. Uh, there are some people who have seen 20, 25, and in fact, a friend I grew up with in the Bronx, your favorite borough, uh, it, uh, it, my friend Glenn Schneider, he has seen 33. This will be his 34th eclipse of the sun. So, uh, okay, next time we'll ask really him to come on the show. <laughs> 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 well, to, to, I've always said total eclipses. When you see it first, it's like potato chips. You become addicted. You have to have more. And uh, quite obviously, I've been addicted because uh, I've seen 11. This will be my 12th, and I hope to see a lot more before I uh, depart this earth. <laughs> well, I'll be going media silent during the eclipse which will force the media into the thousands of people who walk this land, right. who have expertise sufficient to deliver an interview with the press. But you know they're still gonna call you. I don't <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> Seriously. No, no, because I'm. they get lazy and just call me because I live here in New York City, right. and they know I can give them a sound bite, but this this event will sell itself, and so that's why I don't need to be there. And, and my, my location is a state secret. Oh, really? You, you will not know where, where I am on where Earth. Where are you going to be? You'll know I'll be in the path of totality, but you won't know where I am on Earth or my elevation above Earth. <laughs> and you know what's funny is I get asked every day on Twitter where you are going to go watch the eclipse, and to which I... And in case you get tortured, I don't want you to know. Right. Well, I I'm tell people all the time, <laughs> Neil doesn't like me. <laughs> No, he tells me <laughs> nothing. We just work together. What is your problem? <laughs> so, Joe, I'm looking at, at that's your, your office in the back there with all these degrees on the wall. So Joe's wicked smack. Yeah. Um, and you got a total eclipse in the upper corner there, or is that a black hole? No, no that's, that's a view of a total eclipse of the sun. I don't know exactly. I, uh, actually, I have a total eclipse, an annular eclipse, and I have an eclipse that was taken by a, a gentleman from the Amateur Astronomers Association right here in New York. Uh, he is no longer with us. The, the, that dates back to 1945 over Montana, the rising sun over the uh, hills of Montana. 
It's a crescent sun, and a few minutes after sunrise, it went into total eclipse. Wow. And uh, they're they're amazing. That, 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 that is gorgeous. Of course, you've seen it. <laughs> that you can't beat that. It's like uh, the sunrise, and or is it nature's way of saying I just robbed you of a sunrise? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting uh, that the next total eclipse of the sun over little old New York will be on Tuesday, May 1st, 2079, and that happens right after the sun comes up. So if it's clear that morning, it'll be a most probably the most unusual sunrise in New York history. Uh, again, if it happens to be clear. He's hope. speaking that like we're all going to be alive. I'll be sure to mark my calendar. <laughs> put, the, put, put that on my smartphone <laughs> now. <laughs> um, so, Joe, uh, spend a minute just describing what the hell is going to happen. Well, actually, uh, at the very beginning, you don't even know that it's happening. If you're not aware that there's an eclipse that is going to take place, a total eclipse of the sun, what happens is that the moon begins to move in front of the sun. And actually, you have to have a considerable amount of the sun covered before you start noticing that something eerie is happening. The landscape, after about 70 or 80 percent of coverage, the landscape begins to take on kind of a weird look, uh, more of a yellowish color almost like a dusky twilight beginning to descend upon the entire region. But it's not until that last 30 seconds, the last 30 seconds before totality, that it really gets crazy. Uh, it's almost like being at a Broadway play, curtain time at a Broadway play. And you know, uh, if you've been to a Broadway play, they lower the lights very quickly just as the show is about to begin. That's kind of like what it is just before totality. All of a sudden, the sky begins to darken very quickly. And then suddenly, up in the sky where there was once a brilliant ball of light, the sun, you now have this strange eye, if you will, wind with fire appearing in the middle of the sky. And stars come out, the sky uh, gets a, a quality similar to twilight half an hour or 45 minutes after sundown. Uh, and it's just an awesome, awesome spectacle. And it only lasts for, depending upon where you are in the eclipse path, only about a minute or two. In this case, at most, two minutes and 40 seconds. And then after that, we just reverse the procedure. In 30 seconds, up comes the lights. And within a minute or two, it's almost as if there were nothing had happened prior. Uh, it's back to a normal sunny day. And it just it, it floors everybody who sees it for the first time. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to be uh, just stunned about what what's going to occur on uh, August 21st. That, that streaks across the uh, United States from coast to coast. So, so, so um, Joe, I hadn't appreciated this until you just said it now. We there is nothing in life experience that darkens a daytime sky as quickly as the last few seconds of the partial phases of a total eclipse. Mm. Because when the sun sets, it's slightly darker, but it's not pitch black. Right. And <clears throat> some people think it gets immediately dark at sunset because right. they've never paid attention. Exactly. Right. I've had lawyers call me up and say, someone is testifying that they couldn't see anything when they were driving because it was five minutes after sunset. I say, there's a line, line. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So here we have an eclipse where a few percent of the sun exposed is sufficient to just be kind of bright daylight and then bam, darkness, darkness. descends upon the deep. A lot, of people, a lot of people say, you know, what's the big difference? I'm gonna see a 95 or 97% partial eclipse. Is there really the necessity to get into the zone where it's gonna be total? And my answer to that is most unequivocally, yes. Yes, you do want to get into the total band of totality because if you don't, you're going to miss out on a lot. Uh, the, the, it, people are amazed. Even as you just mentioned, Neil, the final couple of percent of uh, sunlight, even if it's a razor thin crescent, still puts out a large amount of sunlight, a large amount of illumination. You got to shut off every little bit of the sun in order to appreciate just how much darker it gets. And with that few percentage points of sunlight remaining, you don't see the stars come out. You don't get that dramatic sunset and sunrise color rimming the horizon. And you don't see that that shadow, the lunar shadow, come sweeping in and over you like somebody throwing a blanket over your head. You really miss out unless you uh, get into that zone of totality. And I think I think that's going to lead to a, to a to a tremendous number of people trying to do that uh, on uh, Monday, the 21st of August. So, wow. so it's been said once and I, and I forgot who said it and I'm gonna to have to paraphrase it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's the difference between seeing a partial eclipse and seeing a total eclipse mm -hmm. is equivalent 
to the difference between kissing your loved one mm -hmm. and having sex with your loved one. <laughs> I love this analogy. <laughs> because because you, they're both pleasing. They're both pleasing. But... I'll you, take either you, one. You, you cannot extrapolate right. from the kiss to sex. There's right. no right. path yes. to land there. Right. It is a completely, it's completely more. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's Ab a whole, uh, it's here. Yes, exactly. It is, it is, right, yeah, yeah, exactly. One is like eating the best, most exotic um, delicacy you could ever find, and the other is like licking carpet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, Lincoln Carpet is unplayed. You, I mean, yeah, that's true. They both still, have to be good. They both have to be good. That's why this yeah, analogy you're right. was good. This analogy was good. I just screwed it up. It, you just messed up badly. How about, how, about being, up. how about being outside? You know, you, you before World Series, seeing a partial eclipse is like being in the parking lot. Seeing a total eclipse is taking your ticket, walking into the stadium, and sitting down in the box seat and getting ready to actually watch physically the game. And it then, is both exciting. And then having sex in the seventh <laughs> in a stretch. There you go. There you go. Now we got There's it. There's a total eclipse for you. <laughs> total eclipse. <laughs> what makes this America's eclipse? It's, called, it's being called the Great American Eclipse because, number one, it's the first time since 1918 that this eclipse is going to be going from coast to coast. Uh, in 1918, we had one that came in from the Pacific coast and uh, went across the United States, ended up going through Florida, exiting out over the Bahamas in 1918. So that wasn't a full American eclipse because it did touch uh, places outside of American soil. This one is being called the great American eclipse because we're the only hot country we are the host of this eclipse. There have been other eclipses in the past, like for example, in 1970, there was one that went through Mexico, went up along the eastern seaboard of the United States, and then went into eastern Canada, the Maritimes. 1979, wait, wait, swept wait, over wait, the Pacific. That 1970 eclipse, that was the Carly Simon eclipse, correct? Uh, no, I think the Carly Simon eclipse was 1972, actually. Oh, oh excuse me. Uh, it could have been the 1970 <laughs> eclipse. It okay. could have been the 1970. Believe you it or not, no Nova Scotia. further now. You just have to... The Carly Simon eclipse? <laughs> what, is that an eclipse that looks at you and says like, oh, you think this is about you, huh? <laughs> What kind of eclipse, what's the Carly Simon eclipse? Okay, Joe, explain. You're so vain, right? <laughs> yeah. Right, the, the song, you're, the Carly Simon song, You're So Vain, and she apparently writes about somebody, some mysterious person who went to fly his Learjet to Nova Scotia to see a total eclipse of the sun. It's a, oh, lyric, right. it's a lyric in the song, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. That could have been one of three eclipses. There was one over Nova Scotia in 1963. There was one in 1970. I personally think it was the one in 1972, July. That was also my very first total eclipse. I saw that one from Quebec, but after it passed over me in Quebec, it went across Nova Scotia. And I think the, the song, Carly Simon's song, was a hit the following year in 1973, which makes me think that maybe she was talking about that 1972. Or maybe she was just making the whole thing up. Who knows? No, the song's about Ned Beatty, I think, so. <laughs> I, 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 Ned Beatty? No, I'm sorry. Warren Beatty. No These are one, two different yeah, Beatty's. Nobody would ever write a song about <laughs> Ned Beatty. <laughs> what the heck is my problem? <laughs> this eclipse is going to be the great American eclipse because we are the host country. There is no other country that we're sharing this eclipse with. And the last time that happened was before this country became a country. Uh, if you go back over the various... Uh, manuals that show you tracks of past eclipses, historical eclipses. The last time this country, if you use the political boundaries, had an eclipse all to its own was back in the year 1245 AD. So, uh, and that was of course before the United States existed. So this is the very first time that we are the sole country and there are countries, uh, people from all over the world that are gonna be converging on just the United States for this great American eclipse. It's just one more way that we're making America great again. Okay. <laughs> I'm taking total credit for this eclipse. Okay. <laughs> by, the, by the way, did either of you know that Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, was born on the day of the eclipse? That makes sense. He was sense. born on the day that makes he was sense. born on the day of a, he was born on the day of a total eclipse of the moon, Donald Trump. I haven't had a chance to look and see if any other president has had a total eclipse or a, any eclipse on on his birth 
day, but Donald Trump has that uh, that recognition of being just, born on the day when there was a total eclipse of the moon. Just to be clear, an eclipse of the moon takes place at the moon. Right. An eclipse of the sun takes place at the earth. earth. So if you are anywhere on the side of the earth that sees the moon being eclipsed, right. you will see the total eclipse of the moon. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So... Anyone, so that's a lot of people that it could be. That could, right, 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 absolutely. Right. So it's not as rare a thing right. to be born under an eclipsing moon as it is to be born under an eclipsing sun. Either way, I'm so great, I block <laughs> out the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Joe, is the, um, the, so what's an average totality among eclipses relative to this one? Well, I mean, it's, I, I think even just a, a one second total eclipse is more amazing than anything that you'll ever see in terms of a partial eclipse. Um, and this one, this one actually, I've been telling people, this is actually the appetizer, this upcoming eclipse this year, because there's going to be another total eclipse over the United States in 2024, only seven years down the road. And that eclipse is going to be better in the sense that the path, the area of visibility of the total phase of the eclipse is going to be bigger as I mentioned earlier, this one is not going to last longer than two minutes and 40 seconds. The one in 2024 is going to last in some places over four minutes. So whereas people will probably get turned on when they see this eclipse in 2017, and the first thing out of their mouths will say, when can I see another one? Seven years from now, in 2024, you'll get another one, and that one will be even better, much better, in fact, in terms of circumstances than what we're going to see this year in 2017. So you get these differences because of the distance that the moon is from Earth is, right. is not constant. So, so is, is that because it's like, what, what, what would you call it? Is it like a depth of field when you're looking at something from a distance and you're like, you use your thumb to block it out, that type of deal? Yeah, okay, but so, so yeah, if the moon is close, in the moon's elliptical orbit around the Earth, if, if we get an eclipse when the moon is closer to Earth, right. then the moon is bigger in the sky. Right. And if at that time we are farther from the sun, because our orbit around the sun is also elliptical. Correct. So the eclipse that I saw way back when, had the moon at one of its closest times to Earth and Earth at one of its farthest distances from the sun. Uh -huh. So it took a long time for the sun, so, for, for the moon, moon to pass in front of the sun. So, okay, gotcha. So my eclipse at peak was seven minutes and 14 seconds. Oh my God, that is amazing. Yeah, so that's at peak, but we couldn't go to where it was peaking because there was a dust storm kicking up over the Sahara, okay? And uh -oh. so we saw it off uh, off more off the coast. So mine was six minutes and 20 seconds. Speaking of which, yes. and since Joe uh, um, is a meteorologist, can, is there a place where you don't want to go because if it's cloudy, you are screwed. We will touch on that <laughs> when we come back from this commercial break on Star Talk. Hey, everybody, just reminding you that everything that we do can be found on StarTalkAllAccess.com, even things that can't be found anywhere else, like exclusive original content. So make sure you go to StarTalkAllAccess.com and subscribe. We're back on Star Talk. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Chuck Nice. Hey. Tweeting at Chuck, Chuck Nice Comic. Thank you, sir. Yes. Love you, man, on Twitter. Uh, we've got with us on video call. The one, the only, the guy who knows the nice guy better than anyone I've ever met, Joe Rayo, yeah. an associate at the Hayden Planetarium. Uh, a, and he's a, a meteorologist, uh, who he, like lifetime television meteorologist. Yeah. He's got the, that meteorologist voice, too. He does. Let, let me hear some of that voice, Joe. Uh, I, this morning for breakfast, I had some eggs vorticity. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Very nice. <laughs> um, so uh, just before the break, we were trying to get it, uh, understand a couple of things. Well, let me let me back up for a minute. Uh, today, people travel with much greater ease than at any time in the history of eclipses. So, is it pos possible that this eclipse will be the most watched ever in the history of civilization? Mm. Because this is America, and everybody's got a car, right. and if you don't drive, you'll have a plane or right. you, whatever. And we all will just gather in this path of totality, this narrow path across the country. Well, Neil, there, there are 12 million people who already fortuitously live in the zone of totality, they the path of totality. Free. Yeah, exactly. It's 70 miles wide. It's 2,500 miles long, stretching from Oregon to South Carolina. However, 
there are an estimated 220 million people, that's more than two thirds of the total population of the United States, 220 million are within a one day's drive, 500 miles of the total eclipse path, which leads one to wonder just how many people either late that Sunday night, the night before, or early that Monday morning, the 21st of August, are going to suddenly decide, hey, let's let's jump in the car and go and see that total eclipse. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be interesting to see. There, there are a lot of, in fact, of the 14 states that are in the totality zone, the DOT, the Department of Traffic, has issued in all of those states warnings as if it were almost like a Category 3 hurricane heading in their direction. Uh, they are warning about major traffic jams, stock up on food because you're going to be in your car for a long time, wow. and even on some of the major interstate roads like I-85 in Georgia or I-5 in Oregon, they're anticipating traffic tie-ups that they have never seen before for all of these people trying to jockey into position to see uh, the total eclipse that day. So so it's possible that 200 million people will see this eclipse. Do you think that that's more than any previous eclipse has ever been witnessed? I'm, I'm not sure. I know that in 1991... That's the Mexico City uh, eclipse. That eclipse. The 1991 eclipse was related to the one that you saw, Neil, in, uh, back uh, back in the 70s. In the same set A very yeah. long eclipse. Yeah, it was, it was about seven minutes long. It passed over Mexico City. The entire population of Mexico City was treated to a total eclipse. And I believe at that time, the population of Mexico City in one sitting was like 23 million people. Wow. Um, so it may not be necessarily in one sitting for this eclipse, but certainly if a lot of people travel into the totality path, this could very well be indeed the most uh, viewed eclipse, total eclipse in, in modern history. No, in, in all of history. All in of, all history. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And if I remember, the 1991 eclipse also went across Mauna Kea, Hawaii, and the, the telescope was able to observe it from there. Wasn't that the same eclipse? Yeah. They, in fact, uh, it passed over the Big Island of Hawaii, and Mauna Kea is there on the top of uh, that extinct uh, volcanic cone. The problem was they saw it at Mauna Kea, but all the people who went to Hawaii to see that eclipse, or most of the people who went to Hawaii, didn't. The, 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 prior to the eclipse, the uh, meteorologists and climatologists said, oh, there's a 95 percent chance of clear weather for the eclipse, because in July, that was the month that the eclipse occurred, they get the trade winds. And when the trade winds blow, usually the weather is clear. Absolutely. But unfortunately, on the day of the eclipse, it was the other 5 percent. There was uh, some sort of disturbance which uh, clouded things over and people actually got rained on in, in Hawaii. Uh, one person actually walked away after that, after the eclipse, and said, "The total eclipse was a total bust, at least for Hawaiians." So uh, the, the, these are the lucky conditions they under which you shoot your meteorologist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to blame you, Joe. You know that, right? They're all going to blame you. <laughs> well, you know that they, you could look at all the weather records. You could see you could see where the best place is based upon long-term records, but it doesn't always work out that way. In fact, Robert Heinlein, who was a very famous science fiction writer, once said, and it's absolutely true, climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. So uh, if you, if you may be in a place where the climatology says it'll be great for viewing the eclipse, but the weather makes up its own mind. If it decides to be cloudy that day and you don't see it, so goes. Okay. So before we get to Cosmic Queries, because this is a Cosmic Queries <laughs> edition, yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, what, spend a minute explaining what we mean by families of eclipses and how there can be a series of eclipses that are all related to one another. There is a, there is a, a family or cycle that was known to the ancient uh, Chaldeans and Babylonians thousands of years ago known as the Saros cycle. And what this is is that it's a, there are three different lunar cycles that seem to come together. It's kind of like uh, hitting the jackpot, let's say, on a, on a slot machine. Um, these three cycles involve the uh, position of the moon in its orbit relative to the Earth, whether it's closer or farther away. The lunar month, also known as the synodic month. Uh, the, these cycles all come together, and uh, it's called the Saros cycle. Saros means repetition, and eclipses repeat after about 18 years and 10 or 11 and one-third days. That one-third of a day is important, however, because when the eclipse returns after 18-some-odd years, the Earth, in that one-third of a day, has turned 120 degrees in its uh, rotation cycle. And so while the eclipse is going to return, it will not return to the same part of the world that it was seen 18 years previous. 
This eclipse coming up, for example, the great American eclipse, 18 years ago, 18 years and about 11, year, uh, 11 and a third days ago, that eclipse occurred over Europe. Well, now 18 years later, 18 years and 10 and a third days later, the Earth has turned 120 degrees. So now it's not over Europe. This time it's our turn here in the United States or North America to see that eclipse. And in another 18 plus years, the Earth will turn again one third of the way around. So when the, this eclipse returns in uh, 18 years, that's in the year 2035, it won't be visible over North America. It'll probably be passing over the Pacific Ocean or parts of Asia. But this cycle was known thousands of years ago to the, the, the ancient sky watchers, and they were able to make some pretty good predictions just by knowing about the, re the repetition of this eclipse cycle and being able to uh, uh, anticipate when eclipses were going to occur. So the eclipse that I saw was in uh, July of 1973, because that's how old I am. Okay. Add 18 and two thirds years to that, you get to the 1991 uh, eclipse. eclipse. Yeah, so that all works out. So, okay. so Chuck, why don't you give us a question? All right, why don't we start off? And we'll, uh, of course, we always start with one of our Patreon patron questions, because these are the people that support us financially. And um, I mean, they bought their way into the question list. I say it all the time, just like your congressman, <laughs> we can be bought. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, this is Will Judy. And uh, Will Judy says this. It's not Judy Well? D now I'm confused. Uh, it could be Judy Well, but it's, or Will Judy. I don't know anyone with the last name of Judy. That's really? what I'm saying. Well, maybe I'm saying it wrong because it's J E U D Y. So it's J U D? J U D. J U D. Okay. All right. All right. So. Where are you all going to watch this beautiful event? I will be in South Carolina where there is some great barbecue. Uh, would you mind meeting me there for a beer? <laughs> so, I, I looked at so the. We already discussed the fact that you're not going, you're in a secret, super secret I'm location. A super government secret spot. Right. The, the, uh, Joe, I think South Carolina has like the least positive weather prospects of the entire track. Is that track? Is that correct? Yeah, unfortunately, places that are near to the Atlantic coast are subjected to a number of things. And if you've ever been down in South Carolina in August, you know, number one, it's hazy. Mm. Number two, it tends to be rather humid. And in the afternoon hours, especially, which is when this eclipse is going to occur, there tends to be showers and thunderstorms that pop up. So it's not the best place to be. But still, even if you see a total eclipse of the sun and it happens to be cloudy, and that has happened to me once out of the 11 times that I've seen total eclipses, it's still a very, very dramatic sight to see. Of course, you don't want to be deprived of a view of the beautiful corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun that appears during totality. But uh, down in South Carolina, hopefully it, uh, the weather will be clear enough for you to see that. But again, in the summertime, not really the best weather prospects for uh, okay, uh, so, so Judy, just Carolina. make sure the barbecue's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next question. Uh, there you go. All right. Uh, this is Eric Varga coming to us from Facebook. I'm aware that the moon is receding from the Earth at a rate of a couple inches per year. How long will it be until the moon's orbit has moved too far to have any more total, total solar eclipses? Ooh. What an incredible Ooh. question. So the moon is getting smaller and smaller. smaller, smaller. The, that means there will be a day where the moon will never in its orbit be large enough to completely cover the sun. Right. They'll still have eclipses, right. they just won't be total. They just won't be total. In fact, we there's the word for a ring is annulus. Annulus. That's a word for, the, it's of Latin for a ring. Right. And so one of the kinds of eclipses is an annular eclipse. Annular, right. Uh, right, and where the sun, the, the moon goes in the center of the sun, you see a ring, a ring of sunlight. Of so, uh, Joe, have you done this calculation? I haven't. There's a, there's a gentleman who lives in Belgium who's wor world renowned. He's a very famous uh, calculator of celestial mechanics. Uh, Jean Mayus and uh, Dr. Mayus has done the calculation and he says that sometime about a billion or so years from now, the moon will indeed be too far away to create total eclipses. Actually, he says that there's going to be a, a few million years where it's going to alternate, where it'll be possible and then not possible. Uh, you'll get periods where uh, the uh, uh, you'll, you'll go through periods where the moon will be too far away and then it'll just be close enough to cover the sun. But in about a billion years or so, according to Dr. Mayus, that will be the time when eclipses of the sun, total eclipses of the sun, will just be a, a thing of the past. So enjoy these uh, spectacles while they last, because enjoy in about a billion years, it. they're going to play. By the way, uh, uh, for 
billion years ago mm -hmm. when the moon formed, it was 20 times larger in the sky than it is now. Wow. So you would have some serious eclipses every, no, not an eclipse again. Right, I gotta, exactly. Yeah, I got to finish my homework. Yeah, you know? just like, where'd the lights go again? Again? <laughs> again? Who's not paying this bill? <laughs> right. Who is not paying this bill? <laughs> yeah, so the moon has been spiraling away over the billions of years. Right. But the rate at which it spirals away will get slower. So it was it was happening fast long ago. Yeah. Yeah. So that, 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 that makes me uh, uh, curious about eclipses from the standpoint of other planets. So if there, an, is there another planet where, it seems as though we are uniquely situated for eclipses, the, the total solar eclipses the way they happen here. Is there another planet in our solar system that might have maybe a couple moons that do the same thing or that align at the same time or you know, that might give us some, some different configurations of an eclipse. Are you interjecting your own question from the Cosmic Query? I, I am interjecting. Okay, that's allowed because you're co-host. That's okay, fine. Good. That's allowed. Yeah, good. Uh, so uh, an interesting fact about the moon and the sun. It is, is the number 300, Joe? The, the, the moon is, uh, the sun is 300 times farther away than the moon is. And the sun is- I think it's 400. 400. The, the sun is 400 times 400. farther away from us than the moon is. Okay. And the sun is 400 times larger than the moon. Uh, so- Look at that. Cancel straight, straight out. And they fit. They, they, uh, and they're free. That, so so anybody else have that ratio in the whole solar system, Joe? I don't think so. Um, and there are so many moons now. I mean, when you and I were growing up in the LED, it was so easy. Jupiter had 12 yeah. and Saturn had 10. A couple and, dozen moons in you know, the solar the, system. Now, now, now just, Saturn alone has like 67 moons and Jupiter right. has like a similar amount. But I think all of those uh, satellites that are going around all the other planets are probably too small to create the same type of effect as what we have here uh, as seen from the Earth. In fact, you might even call the Earth-Moon system a double planet. There's no moon uh, that is proportionally right. uh, so, uh, as large a size as our moon is relative to the Earth, as opposed to all the other planets uh, in the solar system that have uh, satellites to create the spectacle of a total eclipse of the sun. Now, now, before 2006, we would have said Pluto has a larger moon relative to itself, Absolutely. but since it's not a planet, planet anymore, right. it's not in his answer. Exactly. Right, because Pluto's moon, Sharon, is even bigger compared to Pluto than our moon is compared to us. Right. So the size to distance ratio for Pluto, if it were a planet, <laughs> take that ice ball, uh, <laughs> might make it uniquely situated to have a, to experience what Yeah, I think, no, no, but the sun is really, really small out there. Right. So it yeah, because it's so far away. It's so far away. Right, so, so either way, it still doesn't really fit. You there. get an eclipse, but if, if the eclipsing if the object passing between you and the sun is really, really large, right. you're not going to get the beautiful corona effect because yeah. that's right adjacent to yeah, the edge of the sun. It's like just closing your eyes because it just blocks yeah, everything just out. Your eyes. Just right. closing your eyes right. at that point. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Dude, that was great. Okay. Awesome. All right. One minute left. We got one minute left. In this segment. All right. Yeah. You know what? So since we got one minute left, I'm going to give you a... Um, <laughs> What? <laughs> okay, I got to do this because it's, I got to ask you this question just because Andrew Hanks wants to know this, and I'm taking him seriously, mm -hmm. okay? Will the sun melt the moon when it passes in front of it? I'm, uh, I'm not too keen on cheese, and I don't fancy it raining down on me when I, uh, when I uh, go shopping. <laughs> I did not make that up. Andrew Hanks wants to know, will the moon, I'm will the sun... Melt the moon when it passes in front. Okay, here's the thing. Given, that. given how many people think today that Earth is flat, right? this is a high-level question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. We're getting better. We're getting, at least it's thinking about the thermodynamics of the situation. Absolutely. <laughs> See, that's why I asked it, because I knew, and no matter what, Neil will find a way to answer someone's question. <laughs> I don't care how stupid it is, okay? And I know they say there's no such thing as stupid questions, but the people who say that are stupid, so. All right, so Joe, I'll take this one. So here it is. So on the side of the moon that is facing the sun, it's a couple hundred degrees. It's very hot. Very hot. And it will melt almost anything you would eat. Like cheese would just be melted. Right. And so if the moon were made of cheese, half of it would just melt off the face. Right. All right. So, but now the moon is turning, and it takes a month to turn, right. turns out, because it matches the time it takes to go around the Earth. So on the side where the sun is not shining, it, it's like, how cold, how cold does it get on the, on the dark side, the, the unlit side of the moon? 
About 250 below zero. Yeah, Fahrenheit. below zero. Yeah. So that'll freeze it right back up. Right. Right. So, so, so if you want to live on the moon and not melt or freeze, you want to be in a, like a rotisserie right at the boundary <laughs> of light and dark. You just want to find that line of light and yeah. dark and spin around. Just, just rotate. Just right. so you, the side of you that's baked is shared is 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 exchanged intermittently with the side that's frozen. There you go. And that way you stay one one temperature. And see, that's why I ask these questions because we still learn something after all. <laughs> after all. Okay. We're gonna take a break. We'll come back to cosmic queries on the Great American Eclipse with my friend and colleague and and. And Hayden Associate, Joe Rayo on video call. We'll be right back. Hey, Chuck Nice here. You know, a total solar eclipse blocks out the sun. So allow me to enlighten you on a couple of things. Did you like what I did just there? Thing one, Playing With Science is a new show under the Star Talk umbrella featuring Gary O'Reilly, a former professional footballer, and yours truly. Join us as we break down the science of sports. It's where jocks and geeks collide without a concussion, and it's loads of fun. Thing two, Everything that we do can be found on StarTalkAllAccess.com. That's right, in audio and video form. I don't care what it is. If we've done it, it will be on StarTalkAllAccess.com. Plus, full interviews that can't be found anywhere else and exclusive original content that we make just for you because you subscribe to StarTalkAllAccess.com. So do me a favor. Click on the link or click on the link. I don't know where it is. These glasses are blinding me. Maybe it's because they're not solar eclipse approved. I think I'm losing vision. But click on the link and subscribe and watch me go blind. StarTalkAllAccess.com. We're back on Star Talk Cosmic Queries Edition. Special topic, a Mercury Great Eclipse. America. Monday, August 21st, Dateline 2017. I got Chuck Nice. I got Joe Rayo on video call, uh, 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 an associate of the Hayden Planetarium, my go-to man for everything night sky. And in this particular case, it's day sky. Before the next question, can I just make one suggestion to anyone who's watching who's planning to see this eclipse, the first eclipse that he or she has ever seen. Um, a lot of people are gonna try to photograph this eclipse. And my suggestion to any first timer is don't bother taking pictures. You wanna drink in every single last second of the total phase of the eclipse. You don't wanna fumble around with your iPhone. You don't wanna, if you have a camera and looking for the aperture settings or whatever, you just wanna sit and watch and enjoy this entire beautiful spectacle. Because I've told people before, uh, Chuck and Neil, trying to photograph your very first total eclipse of the sun is like your first girlfriend. You're not very good at it. It's over very quickly. And you just wanna do it all over again. <laughs> and that's, it's that kind of a thing. And, okay, since it's like your first girlfriend, do you cry when it's over? Because that was my experience. <laughs> All right. uh, I will add that lately people have been using their smartphone to take video of extraordinary events that are in front of them. And so here's something extraordinary in front of them, and they're looking at a two-inch screen of the extraordinary event. Right. So that, in fact, the cost of keeping a video of it is having missed the event entirely. Absolutely, that's the expense of, the expense of having that video, is right. that you actually missed the thing that you, you were there to see. It was, I, it was some event where the Pope was going by, right. and everybody looking at the Pope through the thing. Right. Look at the man, that just do, what, what right. are you doing? He's right there. He's right, right, He's right. right. Yeah, so uh, maybe you might want to commit this event to your own memory. I tell you what, here's a suggestion. Uh, there are going to be, a, across the path of totality, along the path of totality, uh, so many professional photographers who are going to uh, photograph the event and video the event. Right. Go, watch it, and then buy their photo. Right. We, don't, we don't need your wimpy ass right. <laughs> iPhone picture. Exactly. <laughs> just go, go, just be like, and then put it up, right? And people say, oh, what's that? And like, oh, that's the eclipse. That's the eclipse I saw. I saw, I saw that eclipse. And then, then you have a record of the eclipse, but from, from a professional standpoint. There you go. So, all right, next question. All right, here we go. This is Heath McCasland. And Heath would like to know this, coming to us from Facebook. For astronauts watching from the ISS, will any man-made lights be visible to the naked eye in the umbria of the eclipse? Mm. Interesting question. So, Joe. They, believe it or not, they have already done 
uh, the computations and the astronauts on board the ISS will see the uh, eclipse on three separate um, rotations or three separate orbits of the Earth. They will not see a total eclipse, but they will see, in the most extreme cases, something like an 80% partial eclipse. And when they look down on the Earth, what they will see will be, the, in essence, what looks to be like a black stain that is projected upon the surface of the Earth, be it on the ocean or as it's passing over the United States. And that black stain, of course, is the Earth's, uh, is the moon's umbra, the dark shadow that's going to create uh, the total eclipse of the sun. I, I think only one time in the history of manned spaceflight, uh, I think it was Gemini 12, uh, two astronauts circling the Earth back in 1966 did briefly for a few seconds see a total eclipse of the sun as they passed into the moon shadow. I think one of those astronauts, in fact, was Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon. But uh, it's, 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 I guess, difficult to, you know, get the, the, uh, the space vehicle involved as it's circling the Earth, getting into the shadow of the, of the moon. Uh, but they will be able to see uh, from uh, the International Space Station uh, what's going on down there with that black shadow moving over the Earth and up in the sky with the moon passing across the face of the sun. So, Joe, how fast is the shadow moving on Earth's surface? Well, the moon goes around the Earth uh, at a speed of about 2,300 miles per hour. You would think that that would be the speed as it's moving across the surface of the Earth, but that's not true because we here on the Earth are also on a turning, turning Earth. Yeah. And, and so we are moving, and we are, in some cases, staying with the shadow for a period of time, especially if the shadow is passing over the equatorial regions. Uh, we could stay with it uh, and, and help to slow the movement of the shadow across the Earth down. In this particular case, the shadow, as it goes from coast to coast across the United States, will be moving roughly at an average speed of about 16 or 1,700 miles per hour. It'll be moving actually a little slower over Tennessee and Kentucky, and a bit faster as it's entering the United States from the Pacific coast, but still rather rapid speed. And uh, uh, even if you had a, a, a you know one of those supersonic transport planes, you wouldn't be able to stay in it forever. You, you, the moon eventually is going to win out with that uh, with that fast movement. One of my favorite things to look for, particularly in eclipses where the shadow is not as big as the one that I had seen. Uh, so the, ch the eclipse is shorter. My favorite thing is to watch the shadow approach from the horizon. Nice. Moving at 1,700 miles an hour. It's this cut through the atmosphere, and it is dark in the center, yet it is twilight on each side of it. And here it comes. It goes, and then you are. No one's going to be looking at it because they're all going to be looking up. But the old timers who've seen 10 a dozen eclipses, the greedy ones, we, got, we know the other stuff to look at. Right. That's what, the, the sideshow that nice. makes up the total circus that this is. Sweet. So what else you have? All right. Here we go. Um, uh, Jeff, so stars check. So star check. Wants to know this. Does, I'm sorry I butchered na your name, Jeff. This I'm is your, di if you didn't, we would not know who you were. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here we go. Uh, Jeff wants to know this. Uh, does the solar eclipse give our ground-based telescopes an enhanced view of distant objects due to gravitational lensing? Mm. So are, is there any um, enhanced view of what we're looking out past during the eclipse? And wasn't there, I mean, isn't that how we prove Einstein right about his... You remember this in the year 1919. Correct. Sir Arthur Eddington led an expedition yeah. to test this three-year-old prediction that gravity would bend the path of light. So severe gravity would bend it noticeably, and they, they wanted to do it in an eclipse in 1918, but the, the First World War was, the Great War was still interfering with um, uh, material and personnel movement, uh, so they had to wait till 1919, and sure enough, they made the measurements, the stars, whose light passed near the edge of the sun, which you wouldn't otherwise be able to see in the daytime, right. uh, or, or when you're or, not right, in eclipse. Not in eclipse. Right, right, right. So the positions of those stars were slightly different than when they were six months later, when you would observe them in the dark of night. Um, and that bending confirmed Einstein's general theory of relativity. Right. So, yeah. so that's exactly how that played out. Super cool. Yeah. yeah. What else you got? Super cool stuff. Give me some more. All right. Alan Pelasco from Facebook would like to know this. Hey, Neil, can you please explain why there is no dark side of the moon and why it isn't all dark? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the last two phrases in 
Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon song of the Dark Side of the Moon album from 1973. Oh, really? Yes. I did At not the end of that song, it says, there is no Dark Side of the Moon. It's all dark. Oh! The, but it's way, you gotta listen, you gotta like, that's a headphone moment, yeah, okay? Yeah, I've, I've heard the song. Yeah, no, no, yeah, just check it out I gotta check again. It again. Okay. okay. So, uh, I have weird memory of cosmic references in the, in the history of, of, rock, of rock of all pop, <laughs> of, of all, all rock and roll, okay? Nice. So, um, yeah, so the moon only ever shows one face to us. Okay. There is a far side and a near side for that reason. Right. But all sides of the moon get sunlight. A day on the moon, daytime in the moon is about 15 days long, and then 15 days of night. So, so it's a long day, and when it's night, it's night for 15 days, but it's not eternally dark. So it is a misunderstanding, and I blame Pink Floyd for that. <laughs> I had to undo, they're way more influential than I ever was, just in naming their, so, so you know who got it right? Who got it right? Um, the cartoonist, Gary Larson. Oh, what was yeah. the name of his car what, cartoon? It's called Dark Side. No. Right? Wait. The Far Side. Oh, the Far, the far side. side! Dark Side. See, there's a scientifically literate person right. referencing. The far Side. Yeah, because right. there is a Far Side and there's a Near Side. Gotcha. There is and no the reason it's a Far Side and Near Side is because it's uh, tidally locked. Tidally right? locked. Right. It's yeah. always. So it's, it is turning. It's turning, but it's just showing us at exactly, exactly the, the same, same rate that we it takes are. to go around. We tidally locked in. Oh, okay. So we slowed the, we slowed the moon down. Yeah, the moon out. was spinning like anybody else in the, in in town. Okay, we slowed it down and now it's locked and it will stay that way forever. Wow, it's trying to tidally lock us. Okay, wait a minute. Now that we can't stand for we it. can't stand for that. No, and that'll but it'll take longer to do that than the expected age of the sun, the life expectancy of the sun. We, so we cool. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what else you got? All right, John Reinhold wants to know this: Will there be a measurable air temperature difference during the eclipse? Joe. Yes, they most definitely will. In fact, um, in uh, the middle part of the country where it will be happening uh, at midday, or actually in the eastern half of the country, uh, where it'll be happening at like 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if there's enough of the sun covered, 80, 90 percent or a real total, you could get a temperature drop of 3, 4, 5 degrees or more. And as the air actually begins to uh, contract, with that cooling of the atmosphere, that helps to pull in the winds from all directions. That's why sometimes when you get the midpoint of a, of a major eclipse, a cool breeze suddenly starts to uh, spring up. So most definitely, maybe not so much in the, in the western United States where it'll be during the morning hours, and there hasn't been enough heating taking place yet, but most definitely in the middle part of the country and in the eastern part of the country, you will get a noticeable temperature drop uh, around or soon after the uh, point of mid-eclipse, maximum eclipse. And it's eclipse. not only an actual air temperature, there's also, once the sun is blocked, you're no longer getting radiant heat, okay? Right. You ever notice if someone walks between you and a fireplace, you feel instantly cold? Absolutely. Well, the air temperature is the same. That's true. The air it's, temperature didn't all of a sudden change in that instant. Oh, it's the heat emanating from the fire. It's the photons coming from the fire touching your skin and getting absorbed. It has nothing to do with the temperature of the air. So you blot out the sun, you not only get the cooling that Joe's talking about, you get the absence of photons that you had been basking in. This is why shade is cooler than non-shade in the summertime. Right. It's the only reason why. It's just blocking those photons. It's just blocking this extra source of heat to you. Right. The shade is not really cooler right. than being out in the sunlight. Yeah. It, if you're walking in and out of the shade back and forth, the air is all mixed. I can't wait to lay by a fire with my wife. The next time I'll be like, baby, that's not heat. That's, that's my photons. <laughs> you feel that, girl? You feel, feel, my you feel, you feel my photons? You feel my photons, girl? <laughs> I've got time for one more. I All think. right, All here right. we go. Here what we go. Got? This is actually important. Um, James Cultus uh, asking a very important question here. Um, hey, Neil, uh, are you going to watch the eclipse in person, of which we know yes. you are? Uh, if so, and Joe can uh, chime in on this too, Please tell me what gear you will use. Should we watch through binoculars, telescopes, glasses, wine? <laughs> <laughs> Just hold your glass of wine up. <laughs> Joe, we didn't spend any time on this. Give, it, give us some concluding comments on what's the best way to view the eclipse. Oh, well, the best way, I, you know, everybody uh, has been uh, scrounging around for eclipse glasses. And in fact, believe it or not, now there are knockoff eclipse glasses. These glasses... Uh, are made either of mylar or a special plastic called polymer, and they have been tested. Uh, they have been certified. But there are some places that haven't been certified that could have a scratch in them. You have to be very, very careful with that. A lot of these knockoffs have suddenly appeared over the last couple of three weeks. You don't have to look directly at the sun, however. If you do, you, you, you could also use welder's glass, 
number 13 and number 14 welder's glass. You can get that at any hardware store or welding supply store. It'll turn the sun green when you look through it, but it will be enough so that you'll be able to see it safely. It blocks out both the visible infrared and ultraviolet radiations. But if you don't even want to look at the sun directly, you can just find a shade tree. I think this is most delightful. The light going through the spaces in between the leaves project or dapple the ground with hundreds of these images of the sun on the ground. And if there's a light breeze, they almost seem like they're twinkling. It's, it's the same uh, methodology as when you're doing a pinhole image of the sun. You let the sun's light go through a pinhole, and then you hold a card or uh, a piece of paper about two or three feet away from the pinhole, and you can see the image projected on that screen using the pinhole image. The trees do it for you naturally. And by the way, you could also use a mirror, believe it or not, if you have like, let's say a compact mirror or a small mirror, just punch a hole in a piece of construction paper, put it over the mirror and then turn the mirror to the sun. You could project that image onto, let's say the side of a house and it will project the exact same image that's happening up in the sky. Another very safe uh, way of looking at it. You don't have to worry about blinding yourself. You just look at that projected image using the mirror. So there are a number of safe ways. Don't look at it with sunglasses. Don't look at it directly. Don't use smoke glass. That just transmits the ultraviolet infrared uh, uh, in, uh, uh, radiation into your eye. And since your eyes don't can't sense pain, uh, your eyes, if you're looking through a piece of smoke glass, for example, are being fried without your being aware of it. You'll learn about it later when you see a hole and you can't see anything anymore uh, in that particular spot where you were looking at the sun. During totality, look at the sun directly. That's the only time that you can look directly at the sun during an eclipse is during totality. You know, Charles Schultz, uh, bless his soul, the man who created Peanuts, uh, back in 1963, he did a six-story arc of comic strips with the Peanuts characters looking up at the, uh, getting ready for the eclipse, and Linus, and you remember Linus, who was always the voice of reason among the Peanuts kids, he said in one of those comic strips, it's dangerous to look at the sun during an eclipse, and especially dangerous when it's a total eclipse, giving the impression that the worst time to look is during totality. Linus, you're wrong. You, that, you can look directly at the sun during the total phase only of the eclipse. That's the time to take your eyewear off, put down the projected uh, cards, and look directly up at the sun. That will give you a, a spectacular view, but make sure that when the sun begins to emerge, that you, you put those glasses back on again, because again, even that slight little sliver of sunlight is still dangerous still to look is. at. But in all fairness to Linus, the reason why he thought, thought that is because Snoopy looked at it before it was in its totality, and that's why he wears those sunglasses and they call him Joe Cool. It's not true, so, so he's, cool. Just cool. <laughs> he's just blind. He's just blind. <laughs> A quick couple of tidbits just to end the show with. Go ahead. Um, the two parts of the shadow, uh, the darkest part is the umbra. Mm -hmm. That's totality. And the surrounding area is the penumbra, the penumbra. which is where part of the sun is, is, is covered. Umbra is the same Latin root that we use for umbrella. Nice. Umbrella. Umbrella. And um, umbra are related words. Yes. That's cool. I that thought. is cool. Yeah, yeah. Not only that, as the sun gets more and more eclipsed and there's a thinner and thinner sliver, the source of light becomes more point-like. And we take for granted what our shadows look like on the street. Right. They all have fuzzy edges. Right. You don't think about it because that's just your shadow. As the sun gets narrower and narrower, it, be, it will cast a shadow the way stage lights will cast a shadow with very sharp edges. And all of a sudden, this is what Joe alluded to earlier, there's an eerie effect that takes place around you. Shadows look different. They, they're more precise. They're sharp. They're eerie. They're, you're in an you're in an otherworldly landscape during these last few moments of the eclipse. Man, that sounds like an LSD trip. Then that last little bit of the sun, Joe. What do we call that? That last little bit. We call it the diamond ring. The diamond or the, ring. Or the last, or Bailey's beads. Bailey's beads. Well, I like diamond Yeah, there's, there's ointment for that. Well, I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> so, so the diamond ring effect right. is that last little bit, uh, it's, it's bright on top, and you can still see the outline of the moon, so it looks like a, a wedding ring. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, like an engagement ring. An engagement ring, yeah, that's cool. Joe, we got to end it there. Thanks for, thanks for, for videoing in to Star Talk. Thank you for inviting me, and uh, good luck to all who are going to be at the eclipse uh, on Monday the 21st. Joe, it doesn't take luck. It takes knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Chuck. Hey. 
Love you, man. Oh, I love you too. Man. All right. <laughs> You've been watching, possibly listening to Star Talk, and we've been recording this live at the Mashable World Headquarters, the Mashable Universe Headquarters in New York City. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Chuck Nice, Joe Rayo on video. I've been your personal astrophysicist, and until next time, I bid you to keep looking up. Hey, if you like this, please remember, everything that we do can be found commercial-free, plus exclusive original content, all on StarTalkAllAccess.com.